Our upcoming experiment in Chem 1310 is titled Stoichiometric Characterization of Compounds and Mixtures, and our focus in this experiment will be on practical applications of stoichiometry to the determination of amounts of substances within compounds and mixtures. In Part A, we'll focus on a compound that is made of sodium carbonate and hydrogen peroxide, and specifically we're going to determine the molar ratio of hydrogen peroxide to sodium carbonate within that compound. And in Part B, we look at a mixture of sodium bicarbonate and carbonate, and our goal there is to determine the mass percent of sodium bicarbonate in the mixture. In both parts, our focus is going to be on a reaction that's selective for one of the components, and we're going to use the balanced chemical equation for this reaction, as well as measurements of mass and volume, to work our way into the world of stoichiometry and the world of moles to determine interesting compositional properties of these compounds and mixtures. Let's begin with the discussion of part A of the experiment, which involves the compound sodium percarbonate. Sodium percarbonate is, ironically, what's called a non-stoichiometric compound, which consists of a complex of two or more smaller molecules with a non-integer number of one molecule with respect to the other. So here, for example, we should expect that, in general, N will not be an integer. In fact, the value of N depends on how the sodium percarbonate was prepared and its age and some other factors and so we're not really going to have a firm known value here for the number of H2O2 molecules per sodium carbonate molecule however what we can say just to ballpark it is that this should be somewhere in the range of one to two H2O2 molecules um, per sodium carbonate molecule with a little bit of wiggle room above and below so our goal in this part of the experiment is to determine this value of N and the first thing we should say about this value n is that you should consider it as a molar ratio. It's equal to the moles of H2O2 in some sample of the compound, any sample of the compound really, divided by the moles of sodium carbonate in that same sample. One thing to note here is that although that n appears in the molecular formula, the ratio of H2O2 molecules to Na2CO3 molecules within a single molecule of sodium percarbonate is the same as the ratio on the molar scale, since all we're doing in going from molecules to moles is multiplying by Avogadro's number. So our goal here really, and since experimentally we're, we'll be working with numbers of moles on a relatively large scale, our goal here is to determine the moles of H2O2 in a sample of this compound per mole of sodium carbonate. And to do this, we're going to take advantage of a specific reaction of the hydrogen peroxide component of this sample. Specifically, when we take sodium percarbonate and we dissolve it in water, it separates into the sodium carbonate and hydrogen peroxide portions. And the aqueous hydrogen peroxide that forms, when placed together with aqueous iodide, or I-, and a strong acid such as H2SO4, which we'll represent just as H plus here, these reagents combine in a redox reaction to form water and an oxidized version of iodine that's called triiodide, or I3-. minus. The whole idea behind the method of iodometry is to measure the number of moles of an oxidizing agent, such as H2O2, in a solution by studying its reaction with I-. minus. We can reason here that if we know the number of moles of triiodide that formed as a result of reaction with the hydrogen peroxide, well then, of course, we can reason our way back to the number of moles of hydrogen peroxide using a simple molar ratio. But to measure the number of moles of triiodide, we actually have to take advantage of another reaction that consumes the triiodide. So I3-, minus, which I'm going to draw here in blue, and the reason I'm drawing it in blue is going to become apparent in a second, is going to react with a known amount, a known number of moles, of the reagent sodium thiosulfate, which contains thiosulfate anions, S2O3, 2 minus, in aqueous solution. And this simply undoes that oxidation of the iodide to I3 minus and forms three I minus, or iodide anions, and an oxidized version of thiosulfate, S4O6, 2 minus. We will know, based on measurements and how the experiment is set up, the number of moles of sodium thiosulfate 
it takes to fully consume all of the I3- minus in the solution that's set up as a result of reaction 1. Hence, we can work our way back using a molar ratio built into the chemical equation for reaction 2 to the moles of I3- minus in that solution and from there, as we mentioned before, back to the moles of hydrogen peroxide. That amount of hydrogen peroxide then simply is the moles of H2O2 that appears in this molar ratio. I'm not going to say too much about how to calculate the moles of sodium carbonate because this is all theoretical. We actually have all the information we need once we have the total sample mass and the moles of H2O2 to calculate the moles of sodium carbonate in the sample. I'll only mention a couple of points here. The first point is to think about the mass of H2O2 in the sample and how to calculate that. And the second is to think about how the law of conservation of mass can help us here. Specifically, the idea that within this compound we have only sodium carbonate and hydrogen peroxide. In the second part of this experiment, we're going to be dealing with a solid mixture of sodium carbonate and sodium bicarbonate, both of which are white free-flowing solids. The idea here is you're going to have some sample of the mixture in a reagent bottle, and the goal is to determine the mass percent of the mixture that is sodium carbonate and the mass percent of the mixture that is sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate being NaHCO3 and sodium carbonate being Na2CO3. What we're going to do here is once again take advantage of a reaction that involves only one of the components of the mixture. Specifically, the reaction involves only the solid sodium carbonate. Strong heating of solid sodium carbonate with a Bunsen burner leads to a decomposition reaction in which two equivalents of the sodium bicarbonate decompose to form sodium carbonate solid in a 2 CO3 solid, as well as gaseous water vapor and carbon dioxide. And because these are gaseous, I'm going to draw them in a different color. The fact that they're gaseous is going to be important for this experiment. Let's think about what this means from a conceptual point of view. After we take that sample of sodium carbonate and sodium bicarbonate and expose it to strong heating, which I'll represent with the delta symbol, the mixture or the, the solid that we end up with is actually no longer a mixture. It's just sodium carbonate, Na2CO3, since the solid sodium bicarbonate gets converted into sodium carbonate over the course of strong heating. However, it's also important to notice that some material has left the system, specifically the H2O gas and the carbon dioxide gas have both left the system. So we should expect a smaller mass after strong heating than before. And specifically, the mass difference, the change in mass, is equal to the total mass of water and carbon dioxide lost. The critical question here, and the one that we have to answer before we can work back to the moles of sodium bicarbonate in the original mixture is, what are the moles of water and carbon dioxide within that mass that's lost? How can we translate that lost mass into moles of H2O and moles of CO2. A couple of points about this. First of all, the molar ratio of water and CO2 in this balanced equation is critical since we know that the mixture of gases that departed the system has to reflect that, in this case, one-to-one -one molar ratio. The second point about the mass loss specifically is that even though the molar ratio of water to carbon dioxide is one to one, the mass ratio is not one to one. And that means that the mass of H2O and CO2 lost is not half water and half CO2 because H2O and CO2 have different molecular weights and different molar masses. And so the mass is not half and half. In designing an experiment for the second half of this lab to determine the mass percent of sodium bicarbonate in your mixture, you'll need to think carefully about how to translate that mass loss 
into moles of H2O and CO2, and then work backwards using the 1 to 2 molar ratio of either H2O or CO2 to sodium bicarbonate to get to the mass of sodium carbonate. And once again, just as it was important in part A, the law of conservation of mass is going to be important in this part as well, since what we can now say is that any mass within the mixture that is not sodium bicarbonate must be sodium carbonate. This allows us to calculate the mass percent using only the total mass of the mixture and the mass of sodium bicarbonate that we measure using this strong heating reaction.